Thank you. Thanks, Remick, for the invitation to, to the seminar. So I'm going to talk about some work on um, uh, contextuality, uh, specifically in the context of composite systems and, and how entanglement plays a role in it. But before that, before I do that, Remick asked me to introduce myself. So here is a brief introduction to who you're listening to right now. Uh, well, I'm Ravi. So far as my academic background goes, I did my PhD at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences uh, in Chennai, India, where I did an integrated PhD. So that means my MSc and PhD were kind of together. Uh, they were done together. And uh, after that, I was at the Perimeter Institute where I was a postdoc from 2016 to 2019. I was also a visiting PhD student there uh, during the fall terms of these years. Currently, I'm at the ULB in, at the Free University of Brussels, the French-speaking one in Brussels. So there's two. There's also the Dutch-speaking ones. I'm at the French one. They're, they care about this a lot. Uh, and uh, I'm funded by the FNRS, um, which is a funding agency, uh, the French-speaking Belgian funding agency. Um, and I'm a post senior postdoc since 2020 at, at uh, the team called Quick. Uh, Center for Quantum Information and Communication. Okay, so that's for my academic background. In terms of research, I mean, a one line sort of big picture view of what I care about is essentially features of quantum theory that set it apart from classical theories. That's in particular, it's, uh, I mean, I just use the word non-classicality for all of these features. Different people can mean different things by non-classicality. So uh, I, I'm using it as a catch-all for everything. Um, uh, but more specifically, it's, it's uh, I, think of it in two, two ways. One is how you witness it. So if you're talking about witnessing some form of non-classicality, you need to first define what the relevant notion you are after is. You have to give me a, a mathematically rigorous definition so that it's clear what we're talking about. And then you have to uh, tell me what assumptions I need to make on my experimental setup in order to witness that, that notion of non-classicality, right? So you need to, there are some background assumptions that always go into defining uh, a notion. Uh, and in terms of how to harness it, I mean, the first question is, is it useful for something? Can you connect it to some concrete quantum protocol, for example, where there's an advantage over classical resources? And secondly, if there is an advantage, how do you quantify that advantage? And, and that requires the framework of resource theories. So, so that's kind of a quick overview of the kinds of questions that I look at in my research. So here's just a quick example, right? Like, so with Bell, Bell non-locality, the relevant notion of non-classicality is the failure of something that we call local causality. So that's the notion of classicality. Its failure is, uh, is non-classicality, often also called Bell non-locality. And what are the minimal assumptions we need to be able to witness it? Uh, we need to be able to have Bell inequality violations under uh, the assumption that the experiment is non-signaling between the two parties. Without this background assumption, Back, Bell inequality violations are meaningless because uh, you can always send signals and violate them, right? So, so in that case, it's, it doesn't carry that physical meaning that you want it to carry. Uh, so, so that's the minimal assumption you need. Of course, in practice, maybe you need to make a few more, uh, but theoretically, that's that's what you need. Uh, how to harness it? I mean, it's well known by now that it has many advantages. You can think of non-local games where you know non-communicating communicating parties can have an advantage over classical shared randomness. By using entanglement, uh, you, you have device and QKD. Um, uh, in terms of how to quantify it, you can write down a resource theory. There are multiple proposals for how to quantify a Bell non-locality, one of which I've also worked on, which is under this set of free operations, uh, local operations and shared randomness. So that's that's just a, an example of, of, of the kind of uh, uh, approach one takes when thinking about non-classicality, at least the way I look at it. Uh, so yeah, so there's this big fuzzy cloud called non-classicality. Uh, you know, for any generic notion, I can ask questions about witnessing it or harnessing it, um, and I can make this word, uh, this fuzzy word, precise in many different ways. So I already just mentioned Bell non-locality. Uh, entanglement is another popular way to uh, make it precise what one means by non-classicality. And again, you can talk about witnessing it, harnessing it. Uh, there's um, okay. This is something I'm currently working on on, on how to articulate what it means to witness non-classic, um, like in, in terms of causality, what it means it means to witness non-classicality and, and what it means to harness it. Uh, and of course, there are uh, uh, in the literature, of course, there there are uh, uh, results along those lines. 
Uh, and there's incompatibility where you can ask these questions. Uh, but today I'm going to focus on this particular way of making non classicality concrete, namely contextuality and a uh, specific kind, which is the Koch and Specker, uh, the, the traditional notion of contextuality. And so, yeah, so that's the that's that's what brings me to my talk. Uh, my talk is about contextuality. And um, so that's the notion of non classicality we'll look at. Um, so, yeah, uh, back to the uh, talk itself. Um, so this is joint work with uh, Victoria Wright, who's at ICFO currently. And just yesterday, I heard we got into uh, TQC 2023. So if you're going there, um, yeah, I might see you there. Um, OK, so what's the talk about? Um, it's essentially about the interplay of um, different notions of uh, non-classicality in the context of multi-qubit systems. So on the left-hand side, you have notions that apply to composite systems. So for example, entanglement or Bell's theorem, you need at least two parties to be able to even state the assumptions you know, that, that, that allow you to define uh, these notions. So, so these are intrinsically composite notions of non-classicality. On the right-hand side, uh, there's something called Gleason's theorem, um, and there's the Koch and Specker theorem. So Koch and Specker theorem is what uh, I mean by contextuality in this talk. And uh, uh, these two notions are applicable uh, to indivisible systems in the sense that they're applicable, for example, when your Hilbert space is three-dimensional, which ordinarily you wouldn't think of as two composite systems, right? Uh, as two systems, and uh, because a minimum, the the minimum dimension uh, a composite system would have is d equals four, like a two qubit system, right? So th that's where these two notions make sense. The minimal dimension where these systems make these notions make sense is d equals three. And what we want to do is we want to bring these together, and we want to study them uh, for an n qubit system. So if you give me a system of many qubits, what are the logical relationships between these different notions? Okay. Uh, Okay, so if that's clear, then um, so in terms of uh, just to uh, um, give some structure to the stock, the, the it's in two parts. In the first part, I'll just introduce you to the to the concepts that are necessary to understand the results, the statements of the results, and in the second part, I'll elaborate on the results. I will not try to prove anything in the stock since I was tried asked to give a more colloquium style presentation. Uh, but it's still going to be more uh, a bit more detailed than a colloquium. Um, okay, so how, I hope that's okay. Um, in terms of concepts, uh, we need some very basic concepts, which um, uh, I mean, the first one is entanglement, obviously. Um, so just to recall, an entangled state is something that you cannot write it, write in this form, right? As a convex mixture of product states, you cannot prepare it by using classical shared randomness and doing some local operations. Right. Um, an entangled measurement, so we'll specifically be interested in uh, entangled measurements in this talk. So I'll call a, a, pure, a, a projective measurement uh, an entangled measurement if at least one of the eigenstates, uh, one of the projections is entangled, uh, is, is a projection onto an entangled subspace. Okay. Uh, if one of the eigenstates is entangled, then it's an entangled measurement. Um, an unentangled measurement can come in various flavors. Um, so an unentangled measurement, uh, so namely a measurement where all of the eigenstates are products eigenstates, right? Uh, can come in various categories. So the first category is uh, LOCC, measurements that you can implement by local operations and classical communication. So here's an example. This is an example that doesn't require classical communication. It's just LO, just local operations. So Alice measures in the Z basis, so sees outcome zero or one, and Bob measures in the X basis and sees the outcome plus or minus. Okay, so they're independently doing things. So these are the kinds of measurements you look at in Bell scenarios, for example, right? Because each party is independently doing some measurements. Um, there's also more adaptive measurements you can think of, namely one where the parties are talking to each other. So here, uh, Alice starts the protocol, Alice decides to measure in the Z basis uh, and report the outcome to Bob. So if Alice sees the outcome zero and Bob knows that Alice saw the outcome zero, then Bob is going to measure in the, in the Z basis and record the outcome zero or one. But if 
if Alice saw the outcome one, then Bob is going to measure in the X spaces and record the outcome plus or minus. Right? So this is an adaptive kind of measurement where the CC, uh, the classic communication plays a non-trivial role. So this is an LOCC measurement. Okay, so 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 both of both of them are LOCC. In the first case, LOCC plays no role. In the second case, CC actually plays a role. Um, the second category of unentangled measurements, um, which is in some senses a bit more interesting, is non-LOCC. So these are measurements you cannot implement by local operations and classical communication. Nonetheless, um, they're unentangled. Uh, so these are kind of global measurements that do not require entanglement. Right. So so here's an example. It's a three qubit example. There's no adaptive strategy to implement this. Okay. Uh, one way to see that there is no adaptive strategy to implement this is to note that uh, none of the parties have ha has a fixed measurement basis. So in order to start an LOCC protocol, someone needs to do the first measurement, right? And then condition on the outcomes of that, other parties might do other things. But here, uh, if if you say that Alice starts the protocol, then Alice here is measuring in the in the Z basis, but here is measuring in the X basis. Right, so the basis is switching for Alice. Similarly for Bob, the basis switches. Uh, for Charlie as well, the basis switches. So each one is switching bases conditioned on all the all of the other parties, which means that no one can really start the protocol, right? So so really you need to you, know, you cannot visualize this as an LOCC measurement. It has the systems have to be brought together, and then you do a just a regular projective measurement on the three systems together. You cannot do it in a in a separated way. Okay. Um, can I have a question? <clears throat> yes, please. So concerning this last measurement and this, this non LOCC measurement, mm -hmm. uh, how does it relate to the to this uh, product basis that give rise to uh, non locality without entanglement? So does this mean yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a, this is an exactly that that kind of basis, right? It's it's the, the, the if you take the set of um, uh, uh, states, if I give you a set of eight product states like this. Mm -hmm. And if I ask you to discriminate between them, uh, perfectly discriminate with, between them by using LOCC operations, you cannot do that because in order to do that, you need to implement this measurement. Yeah. And this measurement is not LOCC, right? Does that help? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, any other questions? Um, okay. If there's no questions about entanglement, then we can move on to the next concept. Um, the next one is obviously Bell's theorem. So these are the these were on the left hand side of my very first slide. Uh, so Bell's theorem in one line uh, for those who do not know, but I'm guessing most people here already know what it means. Uh, in one line, it's that if you do product measurements on an entangled state, then for a good choice of the entangled state and uh, measurements, you can violate certain constraints called Bell inequalities. And what this means is that uh, that you couldn't have produced these correlations using uh, classical shared randomness instead of entanglement. Okay, so, so you're certifying a certain kind of non-classicality about the shared state and, and the measurements that the parties are doing. Uh, the setup looks a bit like this. Uh, Alice does some measurement based on some uh, input she receives, some X. Uh, uh, the measurement results in some outcome A, and you know these are the settings and outcomes for Alice, um, and settings and, and outcomes for Bob, Y and B, and B, A, B given X, Y describes the experimental statistics. You collect by uh, doing these measurements on a system that they share in state row A, B, and then you compute some linear uh, functional on, on this uh, set of probabilities uh, that defines your Bell functional. And uh, and this under the assumption that the parties are, um, uh, if they were sharing classical shared randomness, it, it would be bounded by a certain number that gives you the, uh, the the bound on the on 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 these correlations. And if you exceed this number, then you're non-classical in the sense of Bell non-locality. And quantum theory allows you to do that. Okay, so that's that's kind of roughly every well precise uh, yeah I mean every every instance of Bell's theorem will take this form. Okay, so uh, the third notion is part of the, one of the two notions of non-classicality that allow to apply to single systems is uh, Gleason's theorem. So, um, so Gleason's theorem is a statement about um, how the structure of measurements in quantum theory, if you give me the structure of projective measurements, the lattice projections in quantum theory, then that structure under some very mild assumptions is enough to give you the structure of states. It implies the structure of states. In some sense, you can recover the bond rule 
if you start with uh, the structure of measurements and impose some very mild assumptions on how you assign probabilities to these measurements. Okay, um, so more precisely, it looks a bit like this, that if you're given a separable Hilbert space of dimension at least three, so at least three dimensions, so let's say it's, it's a three-dimensional space, and, uh, and then if you ask for a map for a function f, it's typically called a frame function, that maps all projections on H to probabilities. So any map that takes projections to probabilities and satisfies this constraint, namely uh, it's additive over, um, you know, when you take your projections to be mutually orthogonal, then the function is additive, uh, function is additive over there. Uh, and furthermore, on the identity projection, it's, it evaluates to one. Then uh, such a function uh, <clears throat> admits uh, an expression of this form, namely any any probability assignment of this form can be recovered by a, via a density operator row. Okay, so via the trace tra trace pi row. So this is this basically tells you that this function must come from the bond rule, right? Uh, and this is just under this assumption on the on the function, right? So so here all you're asking for the function is to assign probabilities to your measurements in a way that uh, the probabilities add up to one for every resolution of the identity for every complete measurement. Effectively, that's what you're asking, right? Under just that assumption, you're able to get the, the bond rule. So that's the formal statement of this. Um, structure of measurements implies structure of states. That's that's the intuitive sort of content. Um, and then um, the quotient specular theorem, on the other hand, uh, it's, it's sort of a counterpart to Gleason, except it's weaker because what it says is that if you give me the structure of measurements, so you give me again the lattice projections, then that puts a constraint on the structure of states. Uh, so, so it's more in the sense of a no-go. It tells you that certain kinds of states are not possible, okay? Rather than telling you what's possible. Uh, Gleason is a constructive thing. It tells you what is the structure of states. It tells you exactly what the state should look like if you give me the structure of measurements. Quotient specker tells you if you give me the structure of measurements, then it puts a constraint on what states can look like. It doesn't say what the states are, but it says what they cannot be. Right? So it's a no-go theorem in that sense. And, and what does it look like? Uh, the, the formal statement is again, uh, very similar to the previous one. You, have, you need dimension at least three. And then the statement is, not, is about non-existence because it's, it's, it's going to put a constraint, okay? So instead of the map F that we have earlier, the frame function, now we're looking at some map C. Uh, C is just for classical, let's say here, um, which maps projections Instead of arbitrary probabilities, it wants to map them to zeros or ones. So every projection gets mapped to a probability zero or to a probability one, nothing in between, right? In such a way, the, the same additivity constraint that we had earlier for F, but now applied to C. Uh, so for any set of mutually orthogonal projections, you know, it should be additive and for identity, it should be one because this is the certain effect, this always happens. So, um, if you ask for such a constraint on, on a map C, then um, this map C cannot be, uh, it, it does, just does not exist. It's, it's not a quantum state basically, yeah? Um, and uh, intuitively, this is just saying that there is no way to assign uh, outcomes to all possible quantum measurements deterministically in quantum theory. That's, that's what it is saying, okay? Um, and, and once you note the similarities between the two formal statements of uh, Gleason here, F and uh, C here for, for quotient specker, it becomes clear that Gleason uh, implies quotient specker in a sense, right? Because if, if, my, if I'm looking at the full lattice of projections, then once I give you the structure of states that automatically rules out everything that's not a valid state, right? So, and quotient specker assumes that C is one of those things that is not a valid state. So, so Gleason implies quotient specker, okay? Uh, so why do we care about quotient specker if Gleason implies quotient specker? Um, one reason to care about it is that quotient specker is, is much simpler to prove. It's, uh, it requires only a finite set of projectors. Uh, this is typically often called a KS set, a quotient specker set. Um, and uh, instead of the full lattice of projections, I don't need a continuum of projections to be able to prove the quotient specker theorem, even though it is implied by Gleason's theorem, which requires that continuum. Um, I, I can just use a discrete finite set, okay? And um, is, is this clear? Uh, are there any questions? I can take questions right now, otherwise I can proceed.
because conceptually it's i think it's important to appreciate I have one question connection. yeah yeah uh, so uh, so you said that uh, so this function needs to be additive so what's the motivation mm -hmm. behind that um you mean physical motivation or just, yeah. i mean mathematically there's no motivation because it's just like it's just showing you that, <laughs> yeah. that certain function is uh, the physically it's just that your prob uh, probabilities uh, coarse grain in the right way right like if you if you if you're coarse graining certain outcomes uh, different outcomes pi 1 pi 2 and then you say i want to coarse grain the outcome associated with 1 and with 2 into pi 1 plus pi 2 then the probabilities should respect that coarse graining that's what you're saying right okay you're you're asking it to respect it like that's one narrative i can give you i mean i can also come at it from maybe from some other perspective but it's just asking for probabilities to add up in just the right way in, in the way that you course claim. Okay. Right. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. So if there are no questions, then I'll proceed. Um, so, so I said, uh, quotient specker is, is interesting because it in, admits sort of small proofs with finite sets of projections. And there, there's two flavors, at least two flavors in which you can think of uh, uh, quotient Specker. One is um, logical proof of the quotient Specker theorem. So when I say a logical proof, I, all I literally mean is that it proceeds from uh, the logical structure of measurements. If you give me the measurements and their orthogonality relations, uh, which can which one can be measured with which and like stuff like that uh, about projections, then just from that alone, I can prove the theorem, right? Like if you just if the structure of measurements is alone is enough. Then I call it a uh, logical proof of the quotient specter theorem. Uh, on the other hand, if uh, the structure of measurements alone is not enough, so remember this is a finite set of measurements, it's not the full projection lattice. Okay, if the structure of measurements is alone is not enough, but I need to appeal to some uh, structure of states. If I need to do those measurements on some specific states and look at the probabilities and then violate some inequalities based on that, then that's a statistical proof because because it requires me to kind of collect some statistics on some specially prepared state. Right, so this is very much in the spirit of, of of Bell inequality violations, where you need to prepare a specific state and a, a, a good choice of entangled state, and need to measure it uh, with the with a good set of measurements that you see a violation. Right, so it's it's similar in spirit to that, but logical proofs are are different because they they just proceed from a logical. They only require the structure of measurements. Okay, um, and so here's an example uh, of what I mean by a logical proof. So this is a proof in four dimensions. So uh, I've drawn a, a hypergraph here um, with some vertices and with some edges, these hyper edges. And what this hypergraph essentially means is it, it represents um, uh, projections, rank one projections on a four dimensional Hilbert space. And uh, whenever you see a hyper edge, it means uh, it, it's a mutually orthogonal set of projections uh, that forms a complete measurement. Okay, so it's it's so in this case it's four dimensional space. So this is a complete measurement. It has four possible outcomes, right? And how many? Uh, there are nine measurements here. There's the one. This is the first one. This is the second one. This is the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and then three more: seventh, eighth, and ninth, right? So there's nine loops here, and so nine possible measurements. Um, and uh, there are eighteen possible projections here, right? So there are eighteen vertices. And these are the orthogonality relations in some sense, right? So everything that's in a loop is mutually orthogonal, forms a resolution of the identity. And any two vertices that share an edge are, yeah, mutually orthogonal. And this, this set is taken from this paper, this construction due to Cabello, uh, uh, Estiberon, and Garcia Alcane, I think. Um, hopefully getting the pronunciations right. I'm not sure I am. Um, okay, so, so, so this is a construction. And how do you see that there exists no map C? So remember, to prove the quotient specker theorem is to prove that this map C from projections to zero one valuations uh, does not exist, right? So how do we prove that? So any map C has to assign ones and zeros to these guys, right? So these are projections. It has to be, they have to be assigned ones and zeros. So when a map C assigns the value one, I color it orange, that vertex orange. And when a map C assigns the value zero to a vertex, I, it's, it's black here, okay? So, um, so here is a is an example assignment, right? So let's say the map C assigns uh, value one to this projection, and so it has to assign zero everywhere else here and zeros here. This follows from that additivity property, right? And the fact that the identity projection gets the value one. Okay, 
So it has to assign value zeros here. Now, uh, let's say I put a one here. So that puts me, I'm forced to assign zeros here and I'm forced to assign zeros in this context, right? Um, and so then what am I left with? Uh, let's say I'm, I go on this side and I assign a value one here. And so that forces me to put zeros here and zeros here, right? And then I'm left with this, um, uh, I have to do something here, right? So for example, if I put a uh, value uh, assignment one here, then I have to have zeros here, which would also force me to put zeros here, okay? But, but I can't put zeros here because if I put zeros here, then this basis is not going to be normalized. Like these valuations will not add up to one, even though the projections add up to identity, right? So, so it fails that constraint. So here's an, this was an attempt at constructing the map C and we see that it fails uh, in particular this uh, projection. If it's in this basis, it'll need to be assigned the value one, but if it's in this basis, it needs to be assigned the value zero. So the value assignment will have to depend on the context, right? But the map C did not depend on the context. It, it depended only on the projection, not which context the projection appeared in. Okay, so, so this, yeah. Yeah. Can you go back to the cotton packer theorem? Yeah. Because it sounds like it's it's formulated for any set of mutually orthogonal projections. No, but now like the example you presented, this is not a set of mutually and uh, orthogonal projections. It is no like the, the, oh, these four oh. are mutually orthogonal. Yeah, exactly. But not all of them. No, I mean like. No, not all of them. Yeah, exactly. So. so okay. Okay, maybe let me try to clarify. So, so what I'm saying is that there does not exist a map C. So P of H is the set of all projections, right? Not only just the mutually orthogonal ones. And then what I'm saying is that if I look at this map on, does that help? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, so, okay, so, so I, this was an attempt at constructing a, a, an assignment of map C and I showed that this assignment fails, but how do you know that such an assignment never exists, right? So, so the, the argument is pretty combinatorial. It it's just follows from the logical structure of these measurements. Namely that if you were to assign ones and zeros to these nine measurements, then each measurement has exactly one outcome, right? So there has to be nine assignments of the value one because there are nine bases. So there has to be an odd number of uh, value one assignments, odd number of orange colored uh, vertices. However, if you look at the structure of this uh, hypergraph, then every vertex appears in two edges. So this one appears in this measurement and it appears in this one. This one appears in this one and this one. So every vertex is shared by two uh, measurements, right? So it's shared by two bases. And so that means that any, any vertex that is assigned the value one appears in two bases, which means that there has to be an even number of value one assignments, right? And so these two facts are in contradiction with each other, which means that such assignments just cannot exist. So that's, that's basically, that's what I meant by it. it's a proof that proceeds from a logical contradiction. Okay. And look, the, is there a relation between the dimension of the system and the number, the minimal number of like projections that you, that give rise to a contradiction? Uh, I don't know of a straightforward relation. What I do know is I think it was recently shown that this is the smallest number of projections you can have in any dimension that gives you a proof of the quotient specker theorem. So for three dimensions, for example, uh, uh, I think, I'm not sure what the minimal numbers are, but it's like 31 uh, is, is the Conway quotient construction or something. And then maybe, I don't know if there's anything smaller, but there's no straightforward known relationship, I think, between like mm -hmm. the dimension and the minimal set you need. It'd be nice if, if, if someone proved a nice relationship. So for example, it's not known what's the minimal number of projections you need in three dimensions to, uh, obtain such a contradiction. So that's a nice problem for anyone who's a bit mathematically inclined. Uh, I think the conjecture is like 24 is a uh, upper lower bound. I don't know, I don't remember. It cannot be less than 20 something. Is someone, someone had shown this at some point. But did you say uh, that 18 is the, the smallest set in any dimension? In, 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 in yeah, yeah, for, for yeah, uh, well, in three we uh, three we know that it cannot be le eighteen or less, right? Like it cannot be less than eighteen, so it puts a lower bound on 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 how low you can go in 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 three. But we don't know if you can, and we know that there's a construction in uh, with thirty one vectors, but between eighteen and thirty one, we don't know if there is one. And I think maybe someone showed a better lower bound that you cannot have even uh, twenty one, or I don't know exactly like. 
I just remember that there was a paper by some computer science people on this at some point. Um, okay, is it clear? Like what, what the how the proof works? Uh, if it's not clear, please ask uh, questions. So this was all in the service of proving that that map C does not exist, right? So if I just show that it doesn't exist for this small finite set of projections, then I've shown it for the full projection lattice. That's that's what I mean, right? Like because the map had to work for any uh, the full projection lattice. So it proves the quotient specter theorem by using a small finite set. Uh, when it comes to a statistical proof, so here's a three again. So this is in three dimensions, um, and here uh, uh, we have a set of ten projections. So it's a three-dimensional Hilbert space. So every uh, it's, it's the same interpretation. Every uh, hyper edge is a complete measurement. These are mutually orthogonal projections that form a resolution of the identity. And um, and now uh, let's assume that this map C exists, right? Um, for all projections, la uh, the lattice of all projections, then that means in particular it exists for these guys. And here obviously it does exist. I can do a coloring. I can put a one here. I can put zeros here. I can put one here and zeros here. And then I'm forced to put a one here. So this this gives me an example uh, coloring. And now the question is, sorry, if if I can reproduce the statistics of these measurements for arbitrary quantum states um, on three-dimensional systems uh, uh, using uh, convex mixtures of, of um, you know, assignments specified by the map C, right? So, so, so at best, the, the best that any convex, um, any probabilistic assignment that's a convex mixture of deterministic assignments can do is, uh, the best that any deterministic assignment can do, right? So, so, so essentially what you write down is some sort of linear functional here. It's just the sum of these five probabilities, P1, P2, P3, P4, and P5. So this is an example of a, um, um, uh, uh, what you might call a bell cochinch pecker functional if you want, uh, which takes the sum of these five probabilities. And if you assume that the map C exists, then this sum is upper bounded by two. Because any deterministic assignment you make to these guys, the sum of these five is always going to be less than or equal to two. You'll never have uh, more than, you cannot have more than two of these five vertices assign the value one, right? That just follows from the, the structure of the hyperbola. <laughs> and, and in more graph theoretic terms, what it means is that if I just take the orthogonality graph of these five guys, one, two, three, four, and five, then that's a pentagon. And uh, in this pentagon, it's independence number, namely the number of non-adjacent vertices, the max, uh, like the largest set, you know, which of vertices which are non-adjacent, it has size two, right? So, so this number is also connected to the independence number of the underlying orthogonality graph. Uh, the overall point is that if you assume the existence of the map C, then this number is upper bounded by two. Uh, and in this paper by Kliashko, um, and three other authors. So it's often called the KCBS proof. Uh, they showed that there exists a set of uh, uh, cutrate measurements and a cutrate, uh, a cutrate state, a specific state, which if you measure that state with these measurements, then you obtain a value for this um, number that exceeds two. You go up to square root of five uh, with these guys. Okay, so, so if you exceed this value, then you know that you couldn't have produced uh, these probabilities using the map C, right? So, so you rule out the existence of the map C by violating this inequality. Um, is that okay? Yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, here's a more famous example of of uh, contextuality, which you may have seen often. This is the first example that people like to present, which is the Perez Merman proof. Uh, this is also, by our definition, uh, more like a logical proof. Uh, because it follows from the structure of measurements. It's in four dimensions. And here uh, it requires a little bit of a change in the, it requires you to assume a bit more. So instead of the map C, now you have this map V, which is, uh, which uh, the only thing that changes is that the domain of C, instead of just the projections, I make it all self-adjoint operators, okay? And the range is uh, the spectrum. So any self-adjoint operator should be assigned the value which it lies in the spectrum of that, Operator. Okay, so for these uh, uh, two qubit Paulis, um, the valuation, the map V assigns them value one or minus one, right? 
and it must request uh, and furthermore this valuation must respect this uh, functional property that if I take a product of these uh, measurements, then the value assigned to this product should be the product of the values assigned to the measurements, right? So, so this is a expressing that constraint. So identity is always assigned the valuation one because that's the spectrum, right? And, um, um, and these guys are assigned plus one or minus one, plus one or minus one, plus one or minus one. And, and the important thing to note is that each row commutes. So these guys commute, so they can be jointly measured. And each column commutes. So these guys can be jointly measured. These can be jointly measured. These can be jointly measured. And they have certain products, right? So if you take the products of these guys, you get identity, uh, you get identity here, and you get a minus identity here. And so that puts constraints on these valuations. It, 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 puts, it requires these valuations to satisfy the system of equations. And now it's easy to see that uh, if you assume that such a valuation uh, exists, then you run into a contradiction, namely that a simultaneous solution in plus minus one doesn't exist for the system of equations. How do you see that? If you just take the product of the left-hand side, then every term appears in two equations. So this, this one appears in this equation and this equation. So X identity appears here and it appears here. So that is, that is true for every term. So everything squares and on the left-hand side, you get plus one. And on the right-hand side, you get minus one. Right, because there's a single minus one on the right-hand side. So your plus one equals minus one is what you would need to be true for there to exist a solution. And we know that's not true. So you know, such a solution doesn't exist. And, and so, so these valuations do not exist, okay? So this is, this is also um, a proof of the quotient specker theorem. Uh, once you strengthen uh, the domain of C to include arbitrary self adjoint operators and you require this functional property, okay? Note that the C is a special case of V in some sense. Uh, so if you rule out the existence of C, then for the self-adjoint operators that you construct out of things, you also rule out the existence of V. So, so, uh, th so this proof is kind of implied by the non-existence of C. Okay. But the important point here for our purposes is that this proof, uh, it requires entanglement. Namely, um, if I'm saying that these measurements are jointly, uh, if I'm, seriously thinking about the fact that these guys commute as meaning that I can jointly measure them, then I have to ask in what's the uh, two qubit basis, the, the most fine grained basis in which I should be measuring them, right? Uh, to be able to do this joint measurement. And uh, for, so for example, if you look at this third column, the, the basis that diagonalizes this is the Bell basis. So you need to measure in the Bell basis and coarse grain that in three different ways to obtain these three measurements. Um, and so, so in some sense, uh, that's the sense in which this, this, this uh, proof requires entanglement. It requires entanglement because if you're saying that these three guys are jointly measurable, uh, then it means that the joint measurement will necessarily require you to, um, uh, uh, like the most fine grained measurement requires entanglement. Okay. <laughs> um, and uh, what else? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the that's the one observation that kind of motivates this whole project actually. This observation. Okay, so that's the full set of concepts I needed. If there are any questions, please ask now because now I'm going to use all the concepts to state some results. Okay, if there are no questions, then um, uh, let's go to the results. So we introduce all the concepts, right? So entanglement, Bell's theorem, uh, Gleason theorem, and the quotient specker theorem. So now we're going to connect them all uh, in the context of multi-qubit systems by focusing on multi-qubit systems. So this is the first statement. The first statement is that uh, is about the necessity of entangled measurements. So namely that any logical proof of the quotient specker theorem on a multi-qubit system. So if you look at um, uh, a lattice of projections that comes from a multi-qubit Hilbert space. Then, um, you know, if you take projections from that, and if you look at a quotient specker set, and uh, then that set will necessarily contain uh, entangled projections. Okay, so so um, that that's the statement here. So uh, so Perez moment contains entangled uh, projections in that sense. Um, and any generalization of Paris moment, any n qubit generalization will also contain that. Or any, in, in general, any uncolorability proof of that hypergraph style that I was showing you 
will require that uh, at least one of those vertices uh, corresponds to an entangled projector. Okay. So that's the content of, of, of this statement. That's the sense in which you need entangled measurements. Um, Wait, so, I have a question. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, do, do you know uh, some generalizations to the multi qubit uh, system of the, of the Spiros Mervin square? I know that they exist. I can't off the top of my head recall one because I think there's like some, a lot of papers which go do this algorithmic generalization of n, uh, like Perez Mormon to n qubits and, and stuff. So I know that they exist, uh, but I haven't bothered to, to check uh, the exact constructions. Uh, yeah, I think they exist in the literature. Are there any other questions? And why they don't exist for like uh, QDIT systems? Right. So for QDIT systems, you have a um, uh, quotient specker with just a three dimensional system, right? So I don't need entanglement to prove quotient specker. Like if you give me two QDITs, I mean, each QDIT itself has a quotient specker. But when you have many QDITs, many QDITs, spend your many QDITs. Many QDITs. Yeah, but the I can't generalize this result there because uh, each qubit admits a quotient specker theorem, so therefore all unentangled qubit projections will also admit a quotient specker theorem. Do you see what I mean? Like, if you can't do it for a single qubit, qubit then you can't do it for a product. Uh, okay. Thing. Yeah. So so this doesn't generalize to qubits. Uh, so it's, it's it's in the special case of qubits that you need uh, entangled measurements to witness the quotient specker theorem. So it's it's kind of also outlines a, a sense in which qubits are are kind of special, right? So okay. Um, so there are two aspects to note about this result. Firstly, that um, uh, you, if you remember when I was talking about unentangled measurements, I included these non-LOCC measurements. In, in the set of unentangled measurements, right? So these measurements don't seem to offer any advantage over LOCC measurements in uh, obtaining these kinds of proofs of the quotient specker theorem, right? Because the, the most restricted set of measurements is just product measurements, the LO measurements, which is what you do in a Bell scenario. But if we enrich that, if you allow for LOCC and further even allow like, you know, uh, things you cannot do with LOCC, but which are unentangled, even then you don't get quotient specker contradictions. Okay, you need entanglement. That's the that's the sense in which you need a very strong form of non-classicality to witness the quotient specker theorem. Namely, you need uh, entangled measurements. Um, and so the second is obvious. This is what I just said that presence of entanglement in Perez moment is not accidental. It's 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 necessary in any such proof. So no matter which construction you come up with, it'll have to have entangled projections. So if you were trying to construct such sets, for example. <laughs> And if you restricted your search to just product uh, projections, you will never find a contradiction. You'll not never find a quotient specker set. So our result tells you never to look in that space, right? Like you need to look at entangled projections. Um, okay. Uh, the second uh, result is about statistical proofs. So namely any statistical proof of the quotient specker theorem on a multi-qubit system. So if you recall, a uh, statistical proof was one where you pick a set of measurements and you measure them on a specific state and then observe some violations of some inequalities, right? So any such proof with untangled measurements will necessarily require an entangled state, okay? So you need to do these measurements on an entangled state in order to have a, a statistical proof of the quotient speaker. Yeah. Um, and, um, you might ask if this is true for any entangled state, right? Like are entangled states sufficient for such a proof? Is it the case that any entangled uh, state, multi-qubit state gives you a statistical proof of the quotient specker theorem? So note that here we are allowing uh, arbitrary unentangled measurements, right? We're not restricting ourselves to just like local measurements, which is what you do in a Bell scenario, where in which case entangled states are not sufficient for uh, uh, a Bell inequality violation. Yeah, not all entangled states give you Bell violations. But here we are enriching the set of measurements. We are allowing arbitrary unentangled measurements. So, and then we are asking our entangled states sufficient for a such such a proof if you enrich the set of measurements like this. But Ravi, wait. So, um, so whenever yeah. you're talking about entangled states, you mean pure states? Uh, I, I, in this case, it's mixed state, like arbitrary state. Yeah, because uh, yeah, in this case, it's mixed states. Really? 
Is that okay? Yeah. The measurements are projective always because that's the regime in which I think quotient specker makes sense. But states are allowed to be noisy. Um, okay, so uh, so the question is, are entangled states sufficient for such a proof? And I kind of anticipated this, like this, uh, this sort of uh, this result, which is that uh, a multi-qubit entangled state gives you a statistical proof of the quotient specker theorem. So it's useful for proving the quotient specker theorem, if and only if it violates the Bell inequality under local projective measurements. Okay. So no matter what measurements you throw at that multi-qubit state, whether they're LOCC, whether they're non-LOCC, but still unentangled you will never get a statistical violation out of it if you couldn't use the same state to violate a Bell inequality using just local measurements, okay? Uh, so since we already know that there exists mixed entangled states that uh, don't violate the Bell inequality, mean, yeah. So, okay, uh, hey, so I yeah. have a question Hi. about this uh, like last statement. So uh, I think it's still open whether sometimes non-projective measurements, if they offer some advantage, for Bell inequality, right? So here in the statement, mm -hmm. uh, Bell logically, uh, Bell inequality, is it sort of assumed to, do you assume that you- Local, local projective measures. Perform projective, yeah. so it's Bell yes, inequality yes, with projective. Yeah. Yes, okay. yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. But there is a logical yeah. possibility that there exists like entangled yeah. states that are not useful, they violate Bell, in, Bell inequality, but with local non-projective measurements so yes that's that's yeah that's a, that's a possibility but that's the because because throughout the stock i'm only looking at projective measurements of course so that yeah. means also in the bell case i'm only looking at local projective measurements so if you look at the paper the way we state yeah so i mean this is not a very precise statement right like what i mean is if and only if it's violate if it violates the bell inequality under local projective measurements so if right. you look at this statement in the paper we are clear that, that that's what we... okay um, any other questions? Uh, no, you, you, can, you can continue. So yeah. Can okay. So, um, so yeah. Okay. So since we know that mixed entangled states, there exist examples which do not violate Bell inequalities with local projective measurements. We know that, you know, uh, the same states are useless for uh, quotient specker. Uh, you can't certainly get quotient specker if you couldn't get Bell out of them. Um, Okay, so this is a full map of how uh, for unentangled projections, uh, Gleason and quotient specker are related. So if you take multi qubit systems where each qubit is dimension at least three, and if you look at unentangled projections, then you can prove Gleason's theorem because that's basically because you can prove it for a single qubit. So you can prove it for n qubits in some sense. Um, you can also have quotient specker for the same reason. Uh, and plus direct just means that you can have it with um, measurements that are just product measurements. You don't need to look at like other LOCC type measurements. Uh, if you have a, a single qubit, but everything else is a qubit or a higher dimensional system, then you cannot have Gleason's theorem now over over a product of such uh, such product projections. Okay, but you can have a quotient specker theorem because remember quotient specker is no go. And Gleason is more like a go theorem. It tells you what the st structure of uh, states is. So these measurements are not rich enough to give you the structure of states, but they're rich enough to rule out uh, certain kinds of deterministic states. And finally, this is the, the stuff that I was talking about throughout the talk, uh, which is that if you have uh, all qubit systems, then we know that quotient specker cannot be proved with unentangled projections. And that implies that Gleason cannot be proved with unentangled projections because Gleason implies quotient specker. So non-existence of quotient specker implies that you couldn't have proved Gleason with these uh, projections, okay? Um, so, okay, so, yeah. so, so what does it mean like for entangled, unentangled measurements, you have a Gleason theorem for multi QD? Yes. Yeah. yeah, so what does it mean that there, yeah. yeah so you, you can Sorry. recover the Burns rule with the, Yes, yeah. So what you're saying is that the structure of measurements is rich enough that it constrains the valid, the allowed probabilities to be just the quantum probabilities. You can't have more general probabilities. No, you can, no? If yes. you have like product measurements, like product projection measurements, you mm -hmm. can have entanglement, entanglement witnesses, like in the bonds rule. Um, because this will sorry. also recover. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the lattice of, full lattice of projections, right? Like not just like mm -hmm. a specific set of product projections like you see what i mean like that the like like all possible product projections 
product projections exactly so like yeah, if yeah. trace of uh, entanglement witness with such projections you will always get non negative numbers mm -hmm. if witness is normalized to one then they, they are also normalized i mean they, they cannot exceed one um or maybe there's something i don't get no but I'm, it's sorry so so let me let me let me let me clarify so so when I when I say Gleason's theorem is with unentangled projections, what I mean is that the domain of that function f, the the which is this uh, the projection lattice, is now being restricted. I'm reducing it to just uh, product projections, and all po possible product projections, not just a finite set. And then I'm saying is uh, then what I'm saying is that if you ask for the existence of um, uh, of this frame function on this lattice of, oh, no, I mean, on this um, uh, uh, on these product projections, then their orthogonality relations are enough to constrain the frame function to just, um, uh, this is a non-trivial statement. I'm not saying it's obviously true. It was shown, it was proved by, uh, I think, Noel Wallach in, in, in this paper called an unentangled Gleason's theorem. Mm -hmm. So this result was was proved there. So I'm not saying it's 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 obvious to see that that's true. Uh, it's it's not trivial to see. I mean, like they, they, they pro he proved it. And here, all I'm saying is that, um, uh, um, that for for qubits, the fact that you cannot prove Gleason's theorem. So uh, for qubits, you cannot prove. Okay, so that's. <laughs> uh, but for here for qubits, you can, with with our untangled projections. Um, and um, and here this implication is just saying that the no go for quotient specker implies the no go for uh, that you cannot construct Gleason. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Maybe maybe you can. You can explain your question better if I didn't understand. No, I think I propose that you go ahead because the we are okay. in count of time, so I can contact. Okay, you. okay, 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 sure. Um, okay, so uh, just the last bit is just um, a, a very simple application of this this result to uh, certain schemes for quantum computation that uh, which are often called magic state based schemes, where you look at um, you know. A restricted set of quantum circuits, so you don't allow um, a universal quantum computation with your circuits. So it's a it's a sub theory of quantum mechanics. So in this case, it's just stabilizer circuits. So you only do stabilizer gates here, and you cannot do universal quantum computation with these. Uh, but if you uh, inject some uh, special states to these circuits, and then you can simulate arbitrary uh, unitary evolutions to whatever precision you des desire. Okay, like that's kind of this is the model of quantum computation that. That um, uh, it goes often goes by the name quantum computation with state injection, and and uh, a key question here is like which properties pick out these magic states? Like you know what what's special about these? Uh, how do I identify whether a state is a magic state or not? Uh, a magic state is by definition would be one which kind of lifts the circuit to universality, which 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 allows it to do uh, universal quantum computation. Okay. And there was this famous result in like uh, almost ten years ago now I think. Uh, by uh, Mark Howard at all, where uh, they showed that uh, you know these magic states that you inject into your circuit um, for if your circuit is a corporate circuit, so corporate they mean an odd prime dimensional qubit, so three, five, seven, you know, eleven, so on. Um, uh, so for those circuits, um, contextuality supplies the magic, and what they mean by contextuality supplies the magic is that the a state is a magic state, namely it lift, lifts the circuit to universality only if it can be used for a statistical proof of the quotient specker theorem. Okay, so, uh, namely there, that the measurements in the circuit can be used to uh, violate some inequality using on by measuring them on 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 that state. So it's a necessary condition that 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 uh, any state that's a magic state must have statistical uh, violations uh, must admit a statistical proof of quotient specker. Uh, but this doesn't apply for qubits, okay? And it doesn't apply for qubits because qubits admit this Perez Moment style construction, right? Because Perez Moment tells you that for this set of measurements, it's a stabilizer set of measurements. You, uh, and so, so it lies here, that set of measurements. Any state that you measure on this will be con uh, in some sense contextual. There's no, there's no, there's no, because it's a state independent proof, right? Like it only requires a structure of measurements. So there's no way that certain families of states are uh, non-magic states are somehow less special than magic states because they're all contextual with respect to uh, these measurements. So 
So, so this argument works for odd prime dimensions, but it doesn't work for qubits because qubits have Paris moment. And then later on in this paper, um, um, uh, the, these authors, they re, uh, defined a new model uh, where they looked at qubits and they said that, okay, let's restrict the qubit, uh, the, the free stuff in the qubit model. So instead of the stabilizer allowing arbitrary stabilizer stuff, we restrict uh, the free stuff. And, and then they're able to show that under, under some restriction on, on, this, uh, uh, on this free circuits, the states that give you um, universal quantum computation must have uh, uh, contextuality, must have statistical proofs of contextuality, okay? And how is that related to what I've been talking about? Uh, it's related because essentially they impose this restriction, okay? So the restriction they impose is that there exists at least one quantum state you know, that does not exhibit contextuality with respect to the available measurements in the scheme, which means that the measurements in the scheme are incapable of giving you a logical proof or a state independent proof of the quotient spectrum. That's what they're assuming in their scheme, right? And, um, and what this amounts to effectively, if you look at the concrete scheme they propose, is that the, the free circuit, the thing they replace, like the restriction on the stabilizer stuff, is one that uh, doesn't allow any entangling gates. So you cannot implement entangle, entangled measurements with that circuit actually. And so this already tells you that actually this restriction that they impose, uh, one way to uh, satisfy that restriction is to say that you know, whatever you do, your, um, the free stuff you can do should never implement entangled measurements. If that is true, then you satisfy this property. And one way to satisfy that property is to, um, yeah. Uh, because not requiring entangled measurements means that there is no logical proof of the quotient spectral theorem, which means that there's no problem with like from Perez moment type constructions. Okay, so, so that's the connection between like the result that I was showing uh, and this restriction. So you can motivate this restriction starting from our result in some sense, instead of a priori uh, imposing it. And, and yeah, and, and so this is a figure taken from that paper where they look at the, again, it's like the Perez moment square where, you know, you can do, these are the measurements you can do these are single qubit measurements. And these are the measurements you can infer, right? So you know the statistics of this by knowing the statistics of this, these guys, these guys, but this you cannot infer basically because your circuit doesn't allow you to do the entangled measurement that will let you like do these things jointly, okay? So, um, so this is just to kind of show that there's a connection with, with certain uh, restrictions that people have imposed on qubit uh, schemes. Okay, so this is the final sort of takeaway from this talk. We looked at the connections between these different uh, notions, entanglement, Bell's theorem, Gleason, and quotient specker. Uh, one key result was that for multi-qubit systems, quotient specker uh, requires entanglement. In the case of logical proofs, it requires entangled measurements. In the case of statistical proofs with uh, unentangled measurements, it requires uh, entangled states, right? And secondly, that you know you have a proof of um, quotient specker uh, with uh, an entangled state, if and only if that all violates a bell inequality with local projective measurements, right? And so this, so this is now I'm just inverting. And these these directions were known that Gleason for qubits will require entangled projections. Bell's theorem requires, um, uh, of course, entangled states. Uh, Gleason implies quotient specker, and these were the new stuff. These are the new arrows that we added. And now, if you just take the contrapositive of all of these things, this is what I was saying about the. Um, uh, the statement that if you don't allow entanglement in your in your scheme, uh, your restricted circuit, that that explains restrictions on multi-qubit these QCSI schemes, because basically this forbids the existence of Perez moment type constructions by our theorem. And and furthermore, uh, on the kinds of restricted schemes that were proposed um, uh, in the qubit paper, uh, it must be the case that the injected magic states are non-local in the sense that they violate bell inequalities with respect to projective measurements, local projective measurements, okay? So, so these are entangled magic states, actually. These are not even kind of the usual like product magic states. Okay, so thank you, I'll stop here. That's our paper, if you're interested. Okay, thank you, uh, Ravi, for this nice talk. Are there any questions? Oh. Yeah. So I already asked many questions, so maybe uh, the other. I would ask the standard question. Do you have collaborations with uh, experimentalists and do you think that uh, uh, some of your results could be applied somewhere to in some experiment? So I wouldn't say that these are directly applicable to experiments. I mean, not, not, the, um, uh, not these theoretical results, 
but um, because the because the thing is, what I'm interested in actually actually is kind of how these um, magic um, basically characterize characterizing the kinds of um, the, the connection between you know non locality yeah, but maybe with states. also other other projects i understand that here you would ah, like other, to other projects okay, have, okay uh, yeah. relations between uh, well different points of view and uh, proofs yeah. but uh, yeah yeah apart from that uh, do you have some ah, results okay. to be applied ah, yes yes of course like so in general what i uh, the, the the kind of contextuality that i mostly work on is uh, what's called generalized contextuality which the motivation for this is almost entirely coming uh, comes from the fact that uh, real measurements are POVMs; they are not projective measurements, and like you know, you have noise in your experiments. So, how do you certify non-classicality in the presence of that? So, obviously, that that stuff is much more intimately um, uh, related and of relevance for experiments. And in terms of uh, exist, I mean, I have previously collaborated with people at IQC on on an experiment test of generalized contextuality. Currently, I'm just in talks with. Uh, people in Edinburgh for a bit. Like, I mean, not, it hasn't progressed much, but like, yeah, uh, basically Mehul Malik's lab, because basically because the, these, uh, a lot of these quotient specular things require higher dimensional systems and, and those guys, they specialize in higher dimensional uh, entanglement. So yeah, I mean, I don't know, that's just the one, one group, one experiment group that I've been talking to. So that's, that's about it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay, it seems to me that there, there was someone online who wanted to ask a question. So please go ahead. Uh, yes, uh, thanks Ravi for the nice talk. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, yes, um, so my question is that, I, I have two questions. So first question is that for this multi-qubit um, proofs of logical proofs of contextuality. So here uh, you need uh, like for more than uh, two qubits. So do you need always um, genuine type of entangled states or like even by separable states? A, a, a priori, uh, I can't say if you need, gen, gen, uh, you know, genuinely entangled states. All I know is that you need entangled states. You can't do it with, uh, so, so yeah. So, I mean, I think that's an important question. Like, yeah, if you, do you need fully entangled kind of uh, measurements in some sense or, or can you do with less than that, right? Is that what you were asking? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So it's not the case that actually you need fully entangled because actually in our paper we show that yeah you can you can have uh, that that yeah that you can do it with less than you can have proofs of uh, logical proofs of quotient specker with less than fully entangled bases for example. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also uh, the other question was kind of related to this. Like if you look at the bases, I mean, could there be like, let's say so you say that entanglement is necessary. So in that sense, some of the elements of the measurements should be entangled. So do you have some examples where, I mean, even some of the basis, I mean, I mean some of the elements of the basis are like product or something. I mean, not all, but let's say yeah. some of them, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, that's exactly, I think we have that in our paper, like the, so that's the, okay. because we had this question if if like, you know, the, so a Perez moment, so firstly, there's the property that the unit requires an entangled basis. And mm -hmm. in fact, that basis is fully entangled. So you're wondering mm -hmm. if this generalize, if, if yes, this generalizes yes. to arbitrary mm -hmm. proofs. And the answer is no, because uh, okay. that's not true. So, so actually the open general question would be to characterize what kinds of entanglement you need to have this sure. sort of contradictions, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so that simple answer is not, uh, uh, is not true, like, uh, because there's counter examples. I so mean, it, it it's, could, it's more subtle. Yeah. I mean, it could also mean that for some kind of, um, um, say, say some kind of arguments, like this kind of theorems, uh, it may also be like, um, more uh, useful to use those non-fully entangled uh, measurements compared to fully entangled measurements. Like with less entanglement, you can show something more non-classical. Yes, yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that would be, for example, that would be a relevant question to ask. Uh, maybe also for these, like, you know, what kinds of magic states do you need in these schemes? Do they need to be genuinely entangled or? Mm -hmm. Or, or could they be, you know, how, how entangled do these magic states really need to be, for example? I mean, I don't know. Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, I'm just trying to connect your question to maybe something that fits these uh, schemes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. Thanks, thanks for the... Okay, thanks.
thank you answer. yeah yeah thank you i think that we can conclude now so okay thank you again and well see you ravi okay thank you see you